All right, hello. So uh, let me just uh, remind you where we were at the end of the lecture yesterday. Um, so we had been talking about von Neumann algebras. And we introduced this idea of entropy of any state um, on any von Neumann algebra m. And we also talked about the relative entropy of two states, rho and sigma, with respect to a, to a subalgebra m. Um, and we define those for arbitrary von Neumann algebras in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just comment that this one has a generalization to arbitrary von Neumann algebras on infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. This one does not. Uh, because, for example, in quantum field theory, this one is infinite. OK, so uh, and then we were going to try and use this to understand the Rutakinagi formula. Um, so let me draw a picture first, uh, just to help with some intuition. And then I'm going to quote a theorem. Uh, and I had originally planned to prove the theorem, but I think I'll just uh, you know, say a few words about it so that we have time to talk about uh, global symmetries. Um, so I'm going to imagine a situation where uh, in ADS CFT um, M, consists of the algebra of operators, which are in the entanglement wedge of R. So here's the HRT surface. I'm drawing some time slice here containing the HRT surface. Um, and M prime is the algebra of operators in the entanglement wedge of R bar. So uh, the theorem I'm about to quote is just a linear algebra theorem. So it, it doesn't make any reference to ADS CFT. But just to help calibrate your expectations, you should have this picture in mind uh, in thinking about how to interpret the symbols. OK, so, um, so here's the theorem. And this is going to be a theorem um, showing that, so remember in the, we saw in the three Qtrait code and also in uh, the tensor network example that there was this sort of general Rutakinagi formula that came out of the structure of the encoding map. Um, so this theorem is going to generalize that and also sort of rephrase it in this algebraic way. Um, and remember the motivation for that was that we found before that the in the in the Rutakinagi formula we found before the area operator was kind of too trivial it was uh, proportional to the identity, and so that was somehow too restrictive to be what's actually going on in ADS CFT. So now we'll see what the general story is. Um, so okay, so let um, H code um, be a subset of H R tensor H R bar. So I have some big Hilbert space that tensor factorizes. If you want, you can think of it as the boundary CFT with these uh, HR being these degrees of freedom and HR bar being those degrees of freedom. I mean, we have some code subspace. Okay. Then, um, moreover, uh, let um, M be um, a von Neumann algebra on H code. Okay, so here's some subspace. I can pick some von Neumann algebra, which acts within that code subspace. And again, in ADS CFT, you can think of that as being like the algebra of operators in the entanglement wedge of R. Okay. Uh, then the theorem, uh, like the other theorem, will be a statement that three things are equivalent. Um, uh, then the following. We're just stating this fiat, they are equivalent, correct? What? We're stating this fiat, they are equivalent. Well, I'm claiming it's a theorem. Then the following are um, equivalent. Uh, and there are three things. Uh, and as with the previous theorem we discussed, the theorem is not that any one of the three things is true. OK, any one of the three may or may not be true. The theorem is that if one of them is true, then the rest are also true. OK. Um, so the first theorem. Uh, the, sorry, the first condition says that um, for all O tilde in M and for all O tilde prime, which are in the commutant of M, and now let me just say that in defining the commutant of M, I'm defining it on H code. <coughs> so, the, so M prime is the set of operators on H code that commute with uh, everything in M. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that's like the bulk operators over here. Um, then there exists um, OR on 
hr um, or bar prime on hr bar um, such that for all psi tilde in h code, um, we have the following. So we have that if I act with O tilde, or sorry, O R on psi tilde, it's the same as O tilde on psi tilde. If I act with O R dagger on psi tilde, it's the same as O tilde dagger on psi tilde. And moreover, the same for the for the commutant ones. So um, so if I act with O prime R bar on psi tilde, that's the same as uh, um, O tilde prime on psi tilde. And then now here's the one where the notation is really annoying. So O prime R bar dagger psi tilde is equal to O tilde prime dagger psi tilde. Okay, and so sorry, I, when I wrote the paper, I really agonized about trying to simplify the notation, and I couldn't simplify it more than this. So forgive me. Um, so this is like subregion duality, right? It says that any operator in the entanglement wedge of R can be represented in, on the boundary subregion R, and any operator in uh, M prime in the sub entanglement wedge of R bar can be represented on R bar. So this is, this is entanglement wedge reconstruction. Okay, this is the thing that we said we would like to be true. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Except in the fact that there are more symbols for R bar. Yeah, that it's it's notationally asymmetric, but but uh, you know, the content is symmetric. Um, okay, so that's the first condition, and so this this one is, this one is subregion duality. So, or you might also say this is sort of saying that there's quantum error correction, that the, the information is accessible in the subregions like this. Um, okay, so that's, that's condition number one. So condition number two. So there exists an operator, LR, which is in the center of ZM. And so I remind you that the center of M is the set of operators which are in M and commute with everything in M, um, such that for all rho tilde, so for all states on H code, you know, possibly mixed states, we have that if we compute the von Neumann entropy of rho tilde reduced on R in the boundary theory, so that's like the von Neumann entropy in the CFT on this subregion. Um, it's equal to trace of rho tilde LR plus the entropy of the state rho tilde on the algebra M. So that's this algebraic entropy that we discussed last time. It's the generalization of the von Neumann entropy of a subfactor to a subalgebra. Uh, and moreover, S of rho tilde R bar is the trace of rho tilde LR plus S of rho tilde on the commutant algebra. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the Rutaki Nagi formula as I described it yesterday, right? It says that the entropy in the CFT is equal to the expectation value of some operator, which we call the area operator, plus uh, the entropy, uh, the bulk entropy in the entanglement wedge. Okay, and this is saying that that's true for both the entanglement wedge of R and the complementary entanglement wedge of R bar. Okay. Um, Why do you expect this area operator to commute with everything in uh, Yeah, well, that comes out of the that comes out of the theorem. But one one way of saying it is that the area operator kind of has to be shared between both sides because we can approach the surface from either side. So it has to be an element of both M and M prime. Yeah, and in, in, in the proof of the theorem, you, you, you know, depending which way you're going, if you're landing on this as the output, then you land on a formula for LR, and you can see that it's in the center. Um, okay, so that's condition number two. Um, 
Condition number three is that for all rho tilde, and oh, so I, I want to give a name to this, so I'll put it up here. This is the RT formula. Uh, and then finally, the third thing is, is for all rho tilde and sigma tilde on H code, um, we have the following. So we have that at the relative entropy of rho tilde R to sigma tilde R is equal to the relative entropy of rho tilde to sigma tilde on the algebra M and the relative entropy of rho tilde R bar to sigma tilde R bar um, is equal to the relative entropy of rho tilde to sigma tilde on M prime. Um, and this also has a name. This is called JLMS, uh, which is Jefferis, Lukowitz, Molisena, and Sue. Um, so all three of these things previously had been discussed in the literature of ADS-CFT, right? The Rutakinagi formula, entitlement wedge reconstruction, uh, JLMS formula, which says this equivalence of the relative entropies. Basically, this one is kind of saying that um, the states um, in, the, in the bulk description are sort of, well, so let me think of how to say this. If I'm just given the CFT, if I just look at how distinguishable these states are in the CFT, they're no less distinguishable than they are in the bulk. That's the right way of saying this, okay? So, and that, that's kind of the thing that suggests that maybe therefore all the information in the bulk should be accessible in the boundary. Because um, if, if somehow this one was, was less than this, then somehow it would be saying like there was some difference between the two in the bulk, which somehow you couldn't figure out just given the CFT state in R. Uh, so the JLMS formula is saying that, uh, saying that they're sort of just as distinguishable. Yeah, there's a question over here first. <coughs> yeah. 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 So here, so good. So yeah, in the theorem as I proved it, it's a, it's an exact statement. There's an obvious thing to try to put in error bars and everything, right? Like say. You know, say this is true to some accuracy, and this is true to some accuracy, and this is true to some accuracy, and then try and relate, you know, how accurate the different things are. So some subset of those equivalents has been shown in the literature. There's a paper by Patrick Hayden, and I forget some other people from, from Stanford. But it hasn't been done for all of them, so I think it's a thing still probably that needs to be done. But certainly, to actually apply it to ADS-CFT, you'd be using the approximate version of the theorem. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no. I mean, because here I'm just doing linear algebra, right? So, uh, so you know, this. I mean, I drew the picture in the bulk, but this is a theorem. So, uh, you know, the, it, the only input is these, you know, subspaces and tensor factors and so on. So you're uh, saying that this thing exists. Yeah, yeah. That there's some operator that has this property. Um, it is on the intersection of. Two yeah. So there are aspects. I mean, aspects of this are natural from the point of view of ADS CFT. Like, as I said to Ofer, that you know, it's kind of natural to think that it's in the center. Um, yeah, but to see somehow that you're extremizing something. I mean, that w so we saw that that was true in the tensor network. Um, so we saw that well, it was the length of this curve. I guess I didn't show you, but you can argue that this curve has, is, has to be the minimal curve in the tensor network in order for it to work. So then it is the length of something that's minimal. But I don't know how to, I mean, it's probably not true in a general code. Uh, th this formula is true in a general code. That's what the theorem says. But uh, but somehow the minimality, you know, is going to be one of those things where somehow some special properties of have, of holography have to be invoked. Um, yeah. yeah. The other question is how are you going to get? So, Ruta Ganagi was used to discuss slight deformation of the state in the right hand side of the way. Um, yeah, that's one of the things it was used for, yes. Yeah. And in this approach, I don't see how are you well, so the, so that, okay, so David is referring to some whole story where people try to use the Rutakinaga formula to show that there's Einstein equation in the bow, right? So um, the short answer to that is that um, they only use inequalities that are true in arbitrary quantum systems. And so they can only get Einstein equations sort of to the order that it's basically just determined by the being the unique sort of, you know, two derivative geometric action. 
Um, I mean, they do. They also have to put in that it's the area. So you know, if you added higher derivative terms, then it would be it wouldn't be the area. It would be the area plus so and so. Yeah. So I I don't know. I mean, to to me that stuff is a bit circular. I mean the you know the the imp, you know if you put in the root Takanagi formula, to me you're putting in the Einstein <coughs> equation because you're calling it the area. Um, Maybe what you're asking is 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 t is to what extent is this true when we consider you know superpositions of geometries and so on? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm going to comment on that in a little bit. So so let's just hold off on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that's this. Con <coughs> Good, good, good. So yeah, so let me comment on that. So as, so I didn't I, well, I didn't say I said it before, but I didn't write it. So I, here I'm assuming the whole Hilbert space is finite dimensional, and then I prove the theorem. Okay. You can also ask what's true in infinite dimensions. So there was a paper recently about that that I mentioned before by these uh, two students from Harvard. Um, so they showed uh, that uh, one and three are equivalent in that situation, um, which is kind of the natural guess because both one and three make sense uh, for arbitrary algebras. Yeah, two, I mean, some version of two also should make sense, but probably what you want to do is something like compute the difference of the entropy between two states in the code subspace, and then that's something that has a chance of making sense uh, uh, even in infinite dimensions. Um, yeah. Uh, well, the row, so there are states in, the H, in H code, but they, but they can be very different as quantum states. You know, they're not near each other in any quantum sense. They can, for example, they can be orthogonal pure states. But in the larger limit, uh, the fork relative entropy is the next linear the boundary you can generate uh, is over n, n squared. And that different all the same. Well, so here, yeah, so here I haven't, you know, so I, since I'm just doing, any, I mean, this, state, this theorem is true exactly, so we don't have to talk about, you know, order this and order that, right? I mean, if you want to, do the I mean, so for example, I, I didn't say that this is order one or order n squared or anything like that. So the, r roughly speaking, the statement is that the relative entropy is, um, will be order one if you're comparing states which have the same geometry, but they'll be order n squared if you're comparing states that have different geometries. And both cases have been studied in the literature. Yeah. Um, oh, you're asking what's the definition of this uh, entropy? Okay, so uh, yeah, I guess I didn't write that last time, but okay, you got me, I'll write it. So the, the definition of um, rho sigma m, um, I okay, let me write it like this. It's sum of p alpha, so p is the, so let, I'll call uh, p alpha and uh, sigma alpha for these two, I guess, I don't know. Or maybe p alpha and s alpha, that's better, like you said. Um, so it's, uh, it's like this, um, plus some alpha p alpha um, s of rho and sigma, uh, alpha and alpha uh, on, I guess, alpha um, r alpha, I guess, using the notation from last time. Yeah, that's the definition. There's also this relative modular operator definition, which ends up... Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just asymmetric between rho and sigma. It's a fact of life about the uh, about the relative entropy. Yeah. 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 Well, so that's why I so I didn't tell you what this LR is. So I sort of colloquially call it the area operator, but when I defined it before in the RT formula, I said it was the area operator plus corrections. And so the corrections are determined by the higher derivative terms in the effective action. So any people use the PSL constant? Use what? Uh, use oh, to understand the higher derivative terms? Yeah. Uh, well, there are people who do it using the bootstrap, right? Like uh, like Shai, I think, here is one of the people who does this. Are you here, Shai, somewhere? I don't know, maybe he's, a, oh, there's Shai. Yeah, so ask Shai about it if you want to know about that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so okay. So the the maybe I'll just say in words a little bit about how this theorem is proven. 
Um, so, so to get from 1 to 2, you generalize once again the theorem that I proved before about, you know, given this um, recoverability, you show that there's this like circuit encoding picture of, of the state, where from that you can derive the Ryutakinagi formula. So I kind of sketched that last time for the special case of trivial center. Um, and, then this, and then this entropy somehow comes from cutting some generalization of this state chi that we had. So the only difference here will be that um, now there will be more than one chi. So there will be a chi for each alpha and for the super selection, you know, for the different uh, blocks of the decomposition of the Hilbert space. Um, and that's what will allow this to be non-trivial. Uh, yeah, and indeed I should emphasize that, right? Somehow this, uh, you know, this kind of tells you that you really need to be talking about the algebraic version of these things to get an area operator that's non-trivial, right? Because once m is not a factor, then this, this operators in the center can be non-trivial. And so somehow the problem with all our previous examples was that uh, we assume that the bulk tensor are factorized. Um, okay, so then um, to get from two to three, so that's something that was explained, uh, well, I mean, somehow heuristically it was sort of guessed at in this paper, but somehow they ran, I don't know, they ran the argument backwards, but if you run the argument forwards, uh, which is something that I did in a paper with Shi Dong and Aaron Wall, then you can derive this from this. Ba basically sort of by, by doing a linearized perturbation in the state and then integrating the linearized perturbation to get from this state to that state. Uh, and so then you just use simple entropy inequalities. Uh, and then finally to get from here to here, which is also something that we did in this paper with Xi and Aaron Wall, um, that's a little bit fancier, but you, yeah, I mean somehow I'm not sure I can say it in a simple way. You. Uh, I, the intuition is basically what I said. If the states are just as distinguishable on the boundary as they are in the bulk, then somehow the, the boundary has to have all the information about what's going on with respect to this algebra. And so you can kind of formalize that by considering, you know, what kinds of things you would want to know and use them to show that actually it works for any, for any O. The proof is not that hard, but I think I'll skip it because I want to get to the second part of the talk today. Um, okay. Um, now, let, oh, so, so that's all I'll say about the proof of the theorem. Now let's try to interpret the theorem for a little bit, and then we'll switch to talking about symmetries. Um, so the most important comment is that this RT formula, so, so the theorem didn't say that any of these were true. But in ADS CFT, there's actually an argument, that the independent argument that this one is true, which is based on this uh, lukowitz maldacena derivation of the Rutakianagi formula. And so... In, in the first version, they only derive this term, the area term, but then there's a second paper with Faulkner where they derive also this term. Uh, basically by doing the replica trick in the, bul you know, in, the in the bulk and showing that these two things are equal as bulk quantities uh, if you're sort of sneaky in how you do the analytic continuation which is implicit in the replica trick. So I could give a whole lecture about that, about how you derive this from the replica trick, but that's a whole lecture I don't have time to give. Okay. But anyways, the upshot is this one is known to be true in ADS CFT, and therefore that means that the other two are also known to be true. Uh, and that's the proof that entanglement wedge reconstruction is correct, okay? Because remember before we were just doing this solving PDEs and so on, and that was smaller than the entanglement wedge. But this shows that at least formally, there's going to be a construction of every bulk operator in the entanglement wedge. Um, so, and that's important as we discussed last time because, uh, for example, the entanglement wedge can see behind the horizon and the causal wedge can't. So in, from the point of view of trying to see behind the horizon, that seems important. Um, still, it's something that has to be understood better. I mean, now formally we see that you can see behind the horizon, but okay, what do you see, right? You know, is there an interior, that, you know, do I find, I, what was the example last time? Do I find Zoar sitting there behind the horizon? You know, I, 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 don't quite, I don't yet know how to answer that, but, but at least it seems like the tools are there. Um, okay. Um, then, okay, I already mentioned this, but I'll say it again. So to get a non-trivial area operator, you're sort of stuck with the von Neumann algebras, and that's why I inflicted them upon you. So, you know, they just, they keep being useful, and here's another example. Um, so, yeah, let me also say, um, well, I said it again, but let me maybe say, or, so this, uh, I, I think I'll say a little bit more explicitly. So what is this, somehow in going from here to here, I said that there's some generalization of this circuit encoding of what the code has to look like. 
So basically what it looks like is in the bulk, there's this block diagonal decomposition where within each alpha we have a tensor product. Um, and so what the theorem tells you is that the encoded version of this looks like something where there's a UR and a UR bar. And then we have states alpha i sitting in R1 alpha, alpha j sitting in um, R1 bar alpha, uh, and then some state chi alpha, which is sitting on the rest, R2 alpha, R2 bar alpha. Um, so, and then as before, the interpretation of the area operator is that it comes from cutting this state that kind of keeps track of the UV degrees of freedom into two parts. Uh, but now since it depends on alpha, that allows uh, the, uh, the area operator to depend on alpha and that's what makes it non-trivial. Um, okay, um, maybe I'll just make a parenthetical comment which won't mean much to people who haven't thought about it. This idea that there's a non-trivial center of the bulk algebra is very natural from the point of view of the fact that there's a gauge symmetry in the bulk, which is diffeomorphism invariance. So in general, when you have gauge symmetry, it's kind of hard to tensor factorize the theory, even in the lattice, you know, independent of the issue of uh, taking the short distance limit. And what always happens, basically, is that you end up with sort of extra sort of degrees of freedom on the edge here, which are in the center of the algebras on either side. So in electromagnetism, those are like the electric fluxes going through. Uh, and the reason they're in the center is because the thing they don't commute with is the Wilson line that goes across, but that's not something you can generate either out of this algebra or out of that one. Okay. So the fact that the area is in the center is kind of natural from the point of view of GR. It's again kind of one of those things that you can't change without using operators that go from one side to the other. So you can view it as a sort of <coughs> reflection of the fact that there's diffeomorphism invariance in the bulk. Um, Okay, uh, I want to make one other comment, which was alluded to before. Um, so if you look at this formula, so the left-hand side um, doesn't care at all about this structure of the code subspace and so on, right? We just have some state in the CFT Hilbert space. We take the partial trace onto R, and we compute the von Neumann entropy. But the right-hand side actually does depend on the, on the choice of code subspace. Um, you know, it's, uh, it refers to this algebra M, uh, which is defined acting within the code subspace. So in fact, if we change the code subspace, we include a few more states, we include a few less states, um, it changes the split here into what counts as part of the area operator and what counts as part of the bulk entropy. But the sum is always the same, okay? Uh, and that's, for people who've thought about black hole entropies, that's like a totally standard thing that I even mentioned last time, right? Where if you do a renormalization group flow, you can renormalize G Newton and sort of uh, change what the, you know, the area term is scale dependent, right? And, and, the, and this bulk term is also scale dependent because there's a logarithmic divergence and it's only the sum which is universal. Um, so, so and, and in fact, it's very natural, right? Because making the code subspace bigger, you're basically including more UV degrees of freedom, and, right? So if you do that, then sort of less stuff is in this chi and more stuff is showing up in the states you're including explicitly, so then this should get smaller and this should get bigger, uh, and vice versa if you go the other way. Um, so there's a nice kind of RG interpretation of this choice of code subspace. It's kind of more than an analogy. Um, okay, uh, there are a few other things we could talk about, um, but, you know, this question of, superpositions of geometries, what about if there are black holes in the code subspace? So all that you can discuss from the point of view of this formula, and you can see that basically the more stuff you include, kind of the more stuff ends up being accounted for here instead of being accounted for there, but the formula ends up always being true. Um, even if you allow sort of really big black holes, um, superpositions of geometries actually work in a very nice way. So there was, a, there was a paper by Almiri, Dong, and Swingle, and also an earlier paper by Raju and Papadodimus, where they somehow said that there should be a problem with superpositions of geometries. But actually, the problem they identified is completely fixed by this um, kind of entropy of mixing terms in the algebraic entropy. So that's another thing that I could explain in more detail, but I won't. And so it turns out this works fine for superpositions of geometries. Uh, so you don't just have to be in these states uh, where the metric... Um, no, like quantum superpositions, like the state of the vacuum plus the state with the moon with specific coefficients. With phases. With phases. Yeah, yeah, it still works. 
Yeah, yeah. And the problem they identified uh, is fixed <coughs> once, you, once you're careful about using the algebraic entropy. Ba basically, they found these terms, and then they were said, oh, these terms have no interpretation in terms of the RT formula. But actually, they do. You just have to use the algebraic entropy, which is the right thing to use anyways. Um, Uh, yeah, they were wondering about the RT formula. Yeah, I mean, it was, they were coming from this point of view I mentioned before that, you know, how can a linear function be equal to a nonlinear function? And they were trying to use superpositions of geometries to highlight the tension. <coughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this, the, yeah, we already saw examples where this is true exactly, so it, it, there can't be a tension with quantum mechanics. Uh, we just have to see how things work out. Um, Okay, now there's a whole bunch more questions we should ask. You know, what about subadius locality, time evolution, being careful about gravitational dressing, the black hole interior, what about de Sitter space? So most of those I don't know the answer, uh, so I won't say anything about them. Instead, I think I'll stop this part of the talk and then, go, and then switch to talking about symmetries. So any, <coughs> other, any other questions on this, these things? Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, right? Because here there's not two terms to, to pass things back and forth. And that's kind of true in the bulk, too. The idea is that the relative entropy is a well-defined thing uh, without a reference to the cutoff. Um, okay. Um, so now let me erase all this. We're going to switch gears. <coughs> And we'll see how far we get. I have until one, right? I started uh, half an hour ago? Yeah, okay. Okay. So I first want to remind you um, of a set of old <coughs> conjectures about symmetries in quantum gravity. So it's old conjectures. Um, and these are nicely reviewed. Um, uh, in a paper by uh, Banks and uh, Seiberg. This doesn't mean I think they're BS. Um, <laughs> so the first one is that there are no global symmetries. Um, in quantum gravity. Okay. And that's the one that I'm going to mostly talk about today. But let me mention also the other two conjectures. Um, so, uh, so, so gauge symmetries are supposed to okay, be okay, but um, uh, so for any, um, and I'll put it in quotes, gauge symmetry, um, because as you know, gauge symmetry is only a redundancy of description, so really I need to say what I mean here, but for now I'll just, uh, okay, I mean, what, maybe it means what you usually think if you don't think too hard. Um, so for any gauge symmetry, um, there must be states um, in uh, all um, ereps um, of the gauge group. Okay, so that's the second conjecture. Um, and the third conjecture is that, moreover, the uh, gauge group um, must be uh, compact. Okay. Um, so, so none of these conjectures is true in effective field theory. It's very easy to write down Lagrangians, you know, of such and such theory matter coupled to Maxwell theory that violate all three of the conjectures, right? For example, phi to the four theory coupled to gravity has a Z2 global symmetry. Uh, you know, or you can consider Maxwell theory with gauge group R, and that violates this one, right? Or you can, actually it violates this one too if it's pure Maxwell theory because then nothing is charged. Under the under the gauge symmetry, um, so so if this is true, it's got to these. If these are true, they have to be true for some you know reason coming from the non-perturbative consistency of quantum gravity. Um, now, of course, uh, people didn't just make these up. I mean, it goes back to Wheeler. I think most of these, um, you know, they're heuristic arguments based on black holes uh, for why these arguments should be, why these things should be true. Um, Unfortunately, the, the old arguments are kind of, I mean, as I said, they're heuristic. They're loopholes. They're issues that you can worry about. Um, 
And in particular, the, the, the argument for global symmetries only works if the symmetries are continuous. And so you might have thought, well, okay, so maybe continuous global symmetries aren't allowed, but, but maybe discrete ones are allowed. Okay. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, I mean, that would be a kind of weird, right? Um, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, certainly given a continuous symmetry, I can turn it into a discrete symmetry. Uh, it's a little bit harder to go the other way, but, you know, you could take Zn with n large, and it looks more and more like U1. And, you know. um, and moreover, in, in string theory, uh, it seems to be true just in general. You know, also not, you know, there aren't discrete global symmetries that you get from string theory either. Uh, and so, you know, there was some idea that, you know, certainly it would be nicer if this is, if this is just true uh, for all, no global symmetries at all. The other ones also have various loopholes, but since I'm mostly going to focus on this one, I, I, I won't discuss them. Um, so actually, the goal here is to use the previous three lectures, um, this idea of subregion duality, in particular in ADS-CFT, to give better arguments for these three things, at least within the context of ADS-CFT. So, you know, you, you gain something, you lose something, right? What you gain is that you can be rigorous because you have a UV-complete theory of quantum gravity, what you lose is that now that, you know, strictly speaking, I only prove them in ADS. So you could say, okay, what about de Sitter space or something? Now, you know, I don't, I mean, I can hand wave and give arguments why I think that proving them in ADS is enough for proving them in all of the string vacua. For example, you can say things like you can extract the flat space scattering matrix out of, uh, out of uh, ADS CFT. Um, and then you can say, okay, so that, you know, since that, that determines the short distance physics of string theory, you know, okay, blah, 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 I can say all that. But uh, it, it's sort of blah, blah, blah. So, um, so, so, you know, precisely I'll just be working in ADS. Okay. okay, so to begin, um, I first uh, want to get us all on the same page by talking about um, global symmetries um, in, uh, just in quantum field theory. Okay, which is something we've been hearing about, uh, you know, all throughout the lecture series and surely all throughout your education. Um, so I'm going to give a definition. Usually, you know, usually when we learn about these things, we don't give definitions. But if we want to prove things, then we have to give definitions. Um, so here's my definition. So I'll say that a, um, so a QFT has um, an... Uh, and then I'll put in parentheses, so just to simplify the presentation, we'll be discussing internal um, and zero form um, global symmetry um, um, with symmetry group G if. Okay, and then I have to say what properties the theory has. Um, so, uh, okay, if, uh, okay, let me say one more thing. If on RD, so if I study the theory on flat Minkowski space, the following four things are true. <coughs> the first, it's kind of obvious, um, I say there exists U of G, um, a homomorphism from G to unitary operators on um, the Hilbert space of the theory quantized on spatial Rd minus 1. Okay, so that's, uh, I don't have to talk about anti-unitary because I'm only talking about internal symmetries. If there are any condensed matter physicists here, T is not an internal symmetry. I know sometimes they like to say it is, but they're wrong. Um, so hopefully that's not too, not too controversial. Maybe you might ask, why did I say homomorphism instead of representation? Maybe that's something you could ask. Uh, there's a different, the difference between a homomorphism and a representation is that a representation is continuous. Uh, I'm going to sneak in a bit the continuity into the next argument, because when the symmetry is spontaneously broken, the U will not necessarily be continuous. Uh, but it will still exist if you think about things in the right way. Sometimes people say it doesn't, but again, they're wrong. OK. Um, the second criterion is that if I take the algebra of operators in any spatial region R, which I'll call A of R, and I conjugate it by this U of G, um, I just get back the algebra of operators in the region R. Uh, 
So for any region. So this is, uh, this is for any region R um, and for any element of the group G. And so that's the kind of the key thing in quantum field theory, right? I mean, there are all sorts of dumb things that you could call a symmetry, right? Like in, in undergrad, you learn a symmetry is a Hermitian operator that, or a unitary operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. But that's clearly too general, right? For example, uh, you know, the projection operator onto the 267th eigenstate of the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, but it, it's not, I mean, it's not a useful symmetry to talk about. For example, it doesn't have a Noether current or something like that, right? So, so the good symmetries in quantum field theory are the ones that respect the local structure of quantum field theory. So, you know, they send local operators to local operators, line operators to line operators, and so on. Um, so that's what this uh, condition says. Yes? Yeah, that's correct. A is a von Neumann algebra. Yeah, these von Neumann algebras are everywhere. Yes, so any, any operator with support in the region R, it includes. And that includes line or surface operators as long as their support is in the region. Yeah. Um, okay, and then let me, let me put here, uh, I'll put appropriate um, continuity requirements on how this map works. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to inflict uh, continuity of maps between operators on all of you. Words like strong operator topology show up, but... Uh, Anyways, there's some appropriate continuity requirements. So you don't, you don't want that if you change the group by a tiny bit, then you get a totally different operator. Um, OK. Um, that's in our paper if you really want to know about it. Third, um, well, so far I haven't, uh, you know, how do we know what the group is? I mean, uh, you know, you have to say something about the group acting non-trivially. So here's what I'll require. I'll require that for all G, which are not equal to the identity, um, there exists a local operator, O of X, uh, such that U dagger of G, O of X, um, U of G, is not equal to O of X. Okay. So this is where I, in particular, say that I'm not talking about higher form symmetries. So I'm saying that the symmetry is realized faithfully on the set of local operators. Uh, clearly, it has to, I mean, there has to be some faithful requirement, right? Otherwise, you know, the monster group is the symmetry of the standard model. It just happens to act trivially on everything, right? So you, you want to have some uniqueness to the definition of the group. Um, OK, and finally, so I haven't said anything about the Hamiltonian yet. And clearly, I, gotta, I better say something about that if we're talking about symmetries. Um, so here's what I'll require. Um, I'll require that if I conjugate by u, u of g uh, the energy momentum tensor, t mu nu of x, um, then I just get back the energy momentum tensor, t mu nu of x. So that's a little bit stronger than commuting with the Hamiltonian, right? Roughly, you know, I mean, you can, one way to commute with the Hamiltonian is to have something that deletes energy here and creates it here at the same time. But in, again, in quantum field theory, that's kind of not what we want, right? We want, you know, things that uh, act locally. Um, I'm not totally sure if, like, you know, if I say it commutes with the Hamiltonian plus this, it might imply that. I'm not totally sure. But so anyways, it's safer to just assume it. Um, okay, so that's, that's uh, my uh, definition of global symmetry. Any complaints, suggestions? Yes? Why is three important? Well, just, just to I identify the right group, right? Because otherwise, I could just make the group be ridiculously big. And you know, if the elements don't act non-trivially on anything, then it's kind of silly to call it a symmetry. Um, yeah, and, and in particular, I picked local operators uh, just because I wanted to separate it from these other things, other kinds of symmetries, uh, which are also interesting, but might have different properties. Yeah. Yes, it does, because I've phrased everything algebraically. So as Zohar said in his talk, um, the, this is kind of a UV definition. You look at how the operators transform. Um, there is a subtlety which has to do with the existence of this U, which is probably what you're getting at. Yeah, so that's something that people, you know, sometimes in the literature people say it doesn't exist. I claim that in the correct definition in the Hilbert space it exists. So if you like, uh, you, you know, if you take the limit of the Ising model with periodic boundary conditions, then you have the state where everybody is up and the state where everybody is down in the Hilbert space. And so I'm always doing that. Um, yeah. Uh, but with, even, even though you impose three, uh, you can still take the product of G with some other monster group <laughs> where the, you know, the second part actually really 
No. No, because then uh, no, because then I can I can kind of multiply by the inverse of the first one and then just get something that's just in the monster. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions? All right. So actually, I want to discuss a few examples just to help to make this clarify and you know to make it fun. Maybe we'll do this interactively. So I'll, I'll list the symmetry. Um, and then the audience will decide, um, is, it, is it a global symmetry or not? <laughs> OK. Um, so, OK, so let's start simple. So let's talk about phi prime equals minus phi uh, in lambda phi to the fourth theory. All right, so yes or no? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right, this one's a yes. <laughs> OK, um, good. Now, now let's do something a little bit fancier. OK, so let's do phi prime equals e to the i lambda uh, phi um, a prime equals a, where lambda is the constant uh, in scalar QED. So a constant gauge transformation in scalar QED. Yes or no? Not good. Now we're getting some disagreement. <laughs> Or, or who, or who says yes? <laughs> who says no? I say no. <laughs> Show me a local operator that's charged under this. There aren't any. Phi is not gauge invariant. No. <laughs> yeah, but that's not a local operator. <laughs> okay. Um, now, now let's talk about um, the Zn center symmetry um, in uh, Sun Yang Mills. So this is what Zohar talked about uh, in his uh, lecture. So okay, yes or no? Who says yes? Oh, you guys are you guys are failing the test. Show me a local operator that's charged. There are no local operators that are charged under center symmetry. It acts on line operators. Um, every local operator is invariant. So again, we violate condition three. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's keep, you know, I, this is so much fun. Sorry, I, this, you know, I think it's educational. So OK, so let's do, let's do Zn to the j in 2D CFT. So say you have a, a U1 symmetry of a 2D CFT. So then it's holomorphically conserved. So there's a j, which obeys d bar j equals 0. And moreover, you can multiply that by z to the n to get a whole katz moody algebra of, uh, of, uh, of uh, conserved currents. OK. So, so OK, how about this one? Global symmetry? Yeah, no. This one's a little harder. <coughs> Any, anyone want to commit? <laughs> OK, so now here the answer is, of course, for n equals 0, the answer is yes. Um, for n not equals to 0, the answer is no. Um, and the reason is because of the z, this is actually something that doesn't commute with the stress tensor. It obeys some non-trivial algebra with the stress tensor. So according to my rules, it's not a global symmetry. Um, OK. Um, all right, maybe I'll do one more just for fun. So, so OK, I'll do psi prime equals e to the i gamma 5 theta psi uh, for a free massless direct fermion uh, in four dimensions. OK, so yes or no? OK, so this one is a yes. Um, but the reason I mentioned it is because this is a symmetry with an Atuft anomaly. OK, so just because it has an Atuft anomaly, that's OK. It's still a global symmetry. And Zohar also said that in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't gauge this one and the other one. But so what? Well, I'm not gauging them. So it's a symmetry. So Zohar also said that in his talk. So anomaly, Atuft anomalies are not anomalies in the sense of you know, some, in, something bad. You know, they're just uh, a feature. OK, all right, enough with the, with the games. Um, what? what do you call you mean electromagnetic charge yeah. conservation? The um, yeah, it's it's a, that's a that's associated to this. Uh, I mean, it's just some. It's it's not really a symmetry. I'm not sure what to say. It's it's kind of an accident of uh, E and M being weakly coupled or something. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, it's it's kind of a thing that's hard to talk about. I don't know. Yeah, you, you go ask Nadi about it, and he'll get very. Confused. Well, he, yeah, he's also confused. It's something we're confused about. But it's a thing. Uh, but it's not a. It's not a. It's not a thing that you can. 
I'm not sure what's the right thing to say. I mean, for example, if you spontaneously broke it, there's no Goldstone boson, right? So you know, it's it, it's not a it's not a you know things that we like about global symmetries are not true for this. Um, yeah, I mean, somehow, somehow, you know, once you use the equation of motion, it's just the statement that d squared equals zero. Um, maybe another way of saying it is that it's really, it's really just an expression of gauge symmetry. You know, it somehow, it, it somehow expresses a relationship between the equations of motion and Maxwell theory. So it tells you they're not all independent, and so then to get a consistent dynamics, you have to gauge, uh, you have to gauge the symmetry. Yeah. yeah, I think that's how Neuther presents it in her paper, actually. And she knows it's different. She knows it's different. I mean, this paper by Neuther is amazing. There's two Neuther theorems. The first one is the one you know, and the second one is this one. So she shows that if it's a global symmetry, there's a conserved current. And she shows that if it's a gauge symmetry, then the equations of motion are not all independent. There's a differential relation between them. <coughs> and then, so then to get, a, to get a good dynamics, you have to gauge the symmetry. Uh, a smart lady. Um, OK. Um, all right, so, so that's, uh, that's it for the definition. Um, so may, maybe I'll leave it here for now. Um, so now there's another thing I want to talk about, another property of global symmetry and quantum field theory before we get to quantum gravity. Um, and so this is something I call splitability. Um, so in quantum field theory, uh, the degrees of freedom are local, uh, and that's very important for the symmetries. We already sort of realized that here as a constraint on the symmetries. Um, now, for continuous symmetries, as we just discussed, um, the locality is often expressed in a different way. It's expressed by saying that there's a local current for the symmetry. Okay? And indeed, you might ask, you know, is that something that we could derive from, from this definition? Uh, so interestingly, the answer in general is no. Um, but I'm not sure how much more I'll be able to say about that. But there is something that's kind of related to um, the existence of a Neuther current, which is this splitability, which, uh, well, you sort of can't, A, you sort of can derive from this, uh, and B, it also makes sense for, for discrete symmetries. And so I'm just going to talk about this splitability. Um, so here's the definition. So, um, So a global symmetry is uh, splittable. Um, and OK, I'll make a slight generalization. So I'll say it's splittable on sigma, where here now sigma is, a, is an arbitrary spatial manifold. Uh, and so here I'm assuming that the, the symmetry that we found in RD is preserved when we go to sigma times time. Uh, it might not be because of a gravi mixed gravitational and tilt anomaly, but let's just assume that it's preserved when we go to sigma times r. Um, so then we say the symmetry is preserved on sigma. Um, then we say uh, the symmetry is splittable um, if for all um, subregions R contained in sigma and G and G, uh, there exists um, unitary operators U of G and R um, such that if we act with U of G and R on an operator O, Um, it's constrained in the following way. So first of all, um, we get u of g and sigma acting on O. Um, if O is in R, and we get um, O if O is, oh, sorry, well, yeah, OK, let me, I guess I should say is in the algebra of R. Um, and we get uh, just back O if, a, if O is in the algebra of the complement of R. Uh, I guess I've been calling R bar in the lecture, so let me call it that. Um, so this is a symmetry. This, is, this U is an operator that implements the symmetry everywhere in the region R, and it does nothing in the spatial complement of R. Okay. Now, if there is a Neuther current, there's a very simple formula for this U of G and R. Right? We, just, uh, we define U of G and R um, by the integral epsilon a integral over r of star j a. So we just integrate the Neuther current over, only over the region. And then that gives us something that's clearly going to act like the symmetry within the region. 
And it's going to do nothing in the complement of the region because that space like separated from everything in this operator. Um, but this also makes sense for discrete symmetry. For example, like in the Ising model, you know, you can flip all the spins in this region and not flip all the spins outside. Um, now, in the continuum, you have to be a little bit careful. So I didn't say what happens for operators that are not in these algebras. And actually, it's a bit ambiguous because, because what happens right at the edge of the region is something that depends on how you regularize the operator and you know, how you regularize the theory, maybe. So, so I'm just not going to commit to what it does there. I just only say what happens in the interiors of these regions. What? No, no, no. I'm not saying this is a symmetry. I mean, it won't. This will not be conserved. Yeah, this is definitely not conserved. It just acts on the operators in this way. That's all, that's all that I want. Yeah. Um, oh, um, yeah, it doesn't really have a quantum mechanical interpretation. So the question is, can you take space-time to be a manifold that's not R times sigma? So you can, but then the, uh, the expectation values compute don't, you compute don't have interpretations as matrix elements in a Hilbert space. Um, you can try to construct it out of things that do by gluing, but you know, doing some handle decomposition or something, right? But, uh, but that's more complicated, yeah. So for me, I, I always, for me, you know, I like quantum field theory as on R times sigma. You know, these, these other things are for mathematicians. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, although I haven't actually really used it anywhere yet, but uh, yeah. Um, um, well, I guess, so where I would use it is where I would say that um, kind of if you have R and R bar here, then you have these kind of domains of dependence where you can think of the algebra as just living. So that's something where you need. So this one is really all the things smeared in here. And this one is kind of all the things smeared here. And then that's a statement about Lorentz invariant theories. And I am implicitly <laughs> thinking that whenever I say anything. Um, um, yeah, so the way I think about a time-dependent Hamiltonian is that you turn on some background field, some classical background field. That's, that's my definition of a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And then I'm just working on a different background. So we could do that, but I'm, I'm currently not doing that. Um, okay, um, so let me just make uh, two comments now. So you could ask, so are all symmetries splittable, right? We gave a definition, we gave a property, we can ask if the property follows from the definition. Um, if so, that's like some kind of generalized version of Noether's theorem, right? That kind of works also for uh, discrete symmetries. Um, so this is something that's been studied in the literature before. So in the algebraic uh, field theory community, there are arguments, which I think are pretty reasonable, that um, if this sigma, so if, so if um, sigma is equal to R d minus 1, um, all symmetries, all global symmetries um, are splittable. Okay, I don't know any counterexamples, and there are pretty good general arguments for it. Um, Moreover, in CFTs, you can then use the conformal transformation to conclude the same for SD minus 1, okay? Uh, and that's going to be enough for my purposes. Now, it's a fun fact that on manifolds that are topologically non-trivial, it is not true. So there are examples of quantum field theories that are fairly easy to come up with that are not splittable on manifolds of more complicated topology. And in fact, that's related to this issue that Noether's theorem is not always true because um, if, you know, for a continuous symmetry, if there's a Noether current, then it's automatically splittable on all manifolds because you can just use this formula, okay? But actually, there are examples of continuous symmetries that are splittable on uh, Rn but not on other manifolds. And so that, then there's an obstruction to having a Noether current. In fact, you can check that there isn't one. Yeah, so don't, so don't believe everything you learn in school. Um, okay, so that's kind of all I wanted to say about symmetries in quantum field theory. Now let's go to quantum gravity. And, uh, you know, as, as throughout the lectures here, quantum gravity for me means ADS-CFT. Are we talking the domain purely inside? 
black holes in the very early universe, or are we talking also at least at a virtual? Well, I said ADS, so the ter early universe is not ADS. Okay. It's very inconvenient. Um, well, I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, of course. But that's why I do ADS CFT instead of something else. <laughs> Well, you'll see. There's a duality, right? So the definitions on one side might be different than the definitions on the other side. Um, okay, so I wanna, I wanna, now I want to talk about global symmetries um, uh, in uh, quantum gravity. Okay, so there are two immediate issues uh, with the previous definition that we have to deal with. So the first issue is um, this issue that because of diffeomorphism invariance, there don't exist local operators. Um, so my whole strategy of requiring the group to be realized faithfully on the local operators is going to have to go out the window. Okay, So that's the first problem. Um, <coughs> as with the rest of these lectures, I'm going to ignore this problem and reassure you that what I say following can be upgraded to include the gravitational dressing. Uh, but I'm not going to do it explicitly just because I have to pick and choose what I can talk about. Um, the second issue, which I will talk about, is that, well, one thing we've been learning all throughout the week is that um, bulk um, operators um, have a restricted uh, domains. You know, they only make sense in this code subspace, right? And, you know, depending on which code subspace you pick, there might be more or fewer bulk operators that make sense on the whole subspace. Um, so, uh, and that's, that's a little bit troubling because the global symmetries that we want to rule out are exact global symmetries. You know, they're global symmetries, uh, you know, of the whole theory, including the black hole S matrix and so on. And so if we are going to define them only in terms of operators with restricted domain, then it seems kind of hard to see how we're going to get a statement about, uh, you know, properties of the whole theory. Uh, and so somehow we have to deal with that. And so I, that one I will talk about because it's kind of closer to the rest of the rest of the lectures. Um, okay. Yeah, that's right. And so you have to upgrade your definition to something that acts on operators with gravitational tails and then show that the, contra the contradiction still goes through when you're careful about the tail. That's right. Um, so yeah, it's just a business of being careful about the tail, which is sort of a bit uh, frustrating to keep track of. So, um, OK. Um, so um, the way I'm going to deal with the second point um, is I'm going to define something which uh, in our paper we called quasi-local uh, bulk operators. Um, and we define them also to include their gravitational dressing, but I'm just going to suppress that in this discussion. So the idea is that these are operators where um, if you start with the vacuum and then you act with this operator, then you get something in the bulk which you know, may not be localized completely, but it's localized to within some finite radius of ADS. Um, so in particular, this might be something that creates a black hole out of nothing. Uh, it's not just some local low-energy effective field theory operator. Um, uh, in the more careful treatment, like I said, it has some gravitational Wilson line and, and maybe also some Yang-Mills Wilson line, or, you know, some gauge, ordinary gauge symmetry Wilson line attaching it to the boundary. Um, uh, now, these operators are only going to make sense um, on some H code. So these, these make sense. Um, and the way it works is you first decide which operator you want to talk about, and then you discuss the code subspace. Um, because, you know, clearly if we're talking about the ones that create black holes, then they're not going to make sense, you know, say on the code subspace that's just excitations around the vacuum. Um, but we can choose, so as you saw in the tensor network, right, we can pick a larger code subspace, for example, where we remove all the tensors in the center, and that gives us a code subspace where the bulk is semi-classical, sort of beyond some radius. And then in the center, we sort of, you know, don't know exactly what's going on. Okay, and so these O's we're going to allow to act in code subspaces like that. So, so they might be quite big, but in the end, the rule is that eventually there's some radius beyond which everything just looks like the vacuum. Um, now, 
there are two important properties of these operators that I want to emphasize. And as you can guess, these are going to be the operators that the global symmetries act on. Um, so the first property um, is that if you take such an operator and you act on it with a conformal transformation, a carefully chosen conformal transformation, you can boost it all the way to the ADS boundary um, where it becomes a local operator. So that's basically because anything of finite size, right? Think about it in terms of like the angels and demons or whatever, right? Anything that's a finite number of angel and demons here, if you act with one of these, I never remember whether this is called loxodromic or the other thing, but anyways, these, these elements of the conformal group that fix two points and kind of push everything from this point to that point. So if you act with one of those, it gets shrunk down smaller, smaller, and smaller until you get something that when you reach the boundary is a local operator. Um, and, and moreover, um, uh, in, this, in this limit, um, H code is equal to H CFT. So let me try to explain that. The thing is, so what does H code look like? H code is states where you kind of allow some big mess to be here in the center. But eventually out here, everything is nice and semi-classical. And so now when you do this boost, right, the kind of nice and semi-classical stuff over here just gets all moved in and fills the entire space. And the, and the stuff, the states that would have given you trouble where you would have had some big thing here, they get sent off to infinite energy in this limit. Because, you know, if you take a state with, you know, some big finite energy, you know, some big thing sitting in the center of the bulk, and you act with this symmetry, you take it off to something of finite energy, okay? Um, so in this limit, and so this is related to this fact that like the extrapolate dictionary is kind of an operator equation on the whole CFT Hilbert space, but only in the limit where you take R to infinity. Um, okay, so that's the first property of these operators. Um, the second property um, is that all um, CFT um, local operators um, are obtained uh, this way. Okay. And so again, there's a picture I can draw for that. So, uh, so we can think about the state operator correspondence. Okay. Take your favorite CFT local operator and stick it down here at the bottom of the hemisphere. Since it's an operator of definite scaling dimension that's finite, it will create a state in the center here which has some finite energy and which therefore will only um, create things in this region, again, up to these uh, uh, gravitational and gauge tails uh, that we're being a little bit sloppy about. Okay. Uh, more carefully, it will create something which is, uh, you know, has non-trivial stuff in here, plus this semi-classical dressing out at infinity. Um, now, act on this with this symmetry. What happens? <laughs> well, what happens is this operator just kind of sneaks up the side of the sphere in Euclidean signature until in the limit, you just have moved the operator right back to here, and again, it becomes a local operator. So this is kind of the CFT dual description of this process. Um, and since I can do it for any operator, it means that every operator on the boundary you can think of as you know, creating some, you know, it might be creating some very high energy black hole, but if you act with it locally in the CFT, it's just creating it in a sort of very collimated jet or something, uh, that as it goes into the bulk, then it'll spread. Okay. So these are sort of qualitative features of the correspondence. Um, it's, you know, I, it's hard, it kind of hard to say whether they're, you know, proven to be true or they're plausible or, you know, because, I mean, certainly in the tensor network models, they're true. And I think this kind of argument using the state operator correspondence, for me at least, is pretty convincing. Um, so these are the two things I'll need, just to clarify. I need that in the limit that I move this thing to here, the code subspace becomes the whole CFT Hilbert space and that every local operator in the CFT is the limit of one of these guys. You know, every, everything of finite dimension, you know, it just creates some big mess in the bulk, but it's, it's localized to a finite size. Um, okay, yeah. Are you establishing a one-to-one -one correspondence between this non-local objects in the bulk with a local operator in the CFT? Well, I don't want to say it's one-to-one, -one because... Uh, there are objects which are not in the local 
Well, yeah, so I, yeah, I don't want to say it's one-to-one. -one. I just want to say that every CFT operator I can get, every local operator, you know, of definite scaling dimension, I can get this way. Um, but there might be more than one thing maybe that approaches the same <coughs> one somehow because there's some piece that falls off faster at infinity or something. So I, I don't want to... Uh, in this construction, are you assuming <coughs> that this uh, support on which this uh, bulk operator is uh, living is uh, always uh, finite? Yeah, except, again, except for these gauge tails. That's right, yeah. Yeah, except for the you know the Coulomb field and the gravitational field that that, that dress the operator out to infinity. But yeah. Uh, I'm I'm for me it's conformal. I, I yeah I don't have any comments about that. Um, okay. Um, so okay, we're getting there. Let's see how much more. How am I doing? I got uh, a little more than fifteen. Oh, that's great. Okay, we we may even finish early. Yeah. Shocking. <laughs> well, maybe not. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I don't want to. Okay. I, I, careful what you wish for. Um, okay, um, so now, now we can talk about uh, global symmetries. Um, okay, so um, we can say uh, in ADS, uh, quantum gravity theory um, has a global um, symmetry with group G if. Okay, and so we can sort of guess. Um, so, okay, so we've got to have, again, this, uh, this U of G um, on the entire Hilbert space. Okay, uh, so that's saying that the, the symmetry makes sense everywhere. Uh, to be clear, we're not going to rule out, you know, accidental <laughs> symmetries that are only hold at low energy. That happens in string theory all the time. So we're really talking about, you know, symmetries of the black hole S matrix. So this U makes sense in the entire Hilbert space. Um, so two, um, so if you act with this U of G on one of these things that I'll draw heuristically, these quasi-local bulk operators, uh, things that create these localized messes out of the vacuum, um, we get another guy um, which is localized with the same radius. Um, so this is kind of saying you can't act with the symmetry, you know, on a, you know, say a black hole of this size, and when you're done, get a black hole that's, you know, much, much bigger, right? So it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, especially it commutes with the Hamiltonian, right? You know, what do you expect? Um, okay, uh, so so uh, then um, I want to, so now this one I, I have to say a little bit carefully. So I want the action to be faithful on gauge singlet um, uh, quasi-local bulk operators. Um, and so that's because... Um, I want something which in the limit that G Newton goes to zero becomes my old definition in quantum field theory. So if this guy has a gravitational Wilson line, that goes away in the limit G goes to zero, and so it becomes a, that, that is consistent with it being a local operator. But if it's got like a, a Yang-Mills Wilson line going out there, that doesn't go away. Okay, so I want to say it acts faithfully on the guys that don't have any Yang-Mills Wilson lines. They're allowed to have gravitational Wilson lines, but nothing else. Um, yeah. <coughs> Um, no, 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 they're fixed. Yeah, they're fixed. Because you really want it to be acting on the end point of the line. That, that's kind of the real idea, is it's a symmetry that acts on the end points of gravitational dressing lines. Uh, and and, and, gra and gra gauge in gravitational dressing lines. Um, okay, and then finally, um, so this one, when I write it, you'll at first think I'm putting in the answer, but, but I'm actually not, and so I'll try to explain to you. So the last condition is that... Um, it needs to preserve the boundary stress tensor. Okay. Now, I, here I remind you that in gravitational theories, um, the energy is always the boundary term at infinity. It's just the integral of T0, you know, the thing that is T0, 0 in the boundary CFT. And if you think about evolving a time slice, right, in the bulk, if you just move the time slice up and down like that, that's a, that's a diffeomorphism. It's not something that acts physically on the Hilbert space. So if you want to ask if something is conserved, what you have to ask is how it changes as you change its boundary. You know, so you have, some time, you have some time slice which intersects the ADS boundary. And so what acting with the energy momentum tensor does, maybe I'll draw a picture up here, the boundary energy momentum tensor. Um, so here's some time slice. If you act with it, then you're kind of doing that, okay? And that's the correct definition of what it means to say that something is conserved in gravity. So, for example, if you write down, uh, 
you know, do some effective field theory with, uh, you know, lambda phi to the fourth theory or something, and you ask what does the global symmetry do, this is actually what it does. It commutes with the boundary stress tensor. Um, okay. Still feeling uh, running down the trail at Masada. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so okay. So let me first make a claim. All right, kind of obvious. So um, this definition um, implies uh, a global symmetry of uh, the boundary CFT. Um, so let let's try to talk through it. Um, so this one is the same as condition one for the boundary CFT. Um, so this one, well, let's think about it. So if we take this O and then we take this limiting procedure as it approaches the boundary, then this says that U uh, sends a local operator to a local operator at the same point. That's the limit of this statement under a conformal transformation. Okay, so that was condition number two. Uh, here I emphasize that the boundary is the sphere, so the local operators generate everything. We don't have to worry about line and surface operators. Um, uh, so this one again, um, so we can take whichever one that is a singlet and we can send that one to the boundary and now we get a local operator that transforms under whichever element of the group we want. So that was condition three. And then this one is obviously condition four in the boundary CFT. So global symmetry in the bulk implies global symmetry in the boundary. Okay. Now you should start getting worried. Why, why is this worrying? What, 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 what do you usually think a global symmetry in the boundary is dual to? Usually we say it's dual to a, I'll put it in quotes, gauge symmetry in the bulk. Right. Um, so somehow something smells fishy here. Uh -huh. Now, one way that I could try to indeed show that it's fishy is I could try to derive for you that indeed a global symmetry of the boundary theory is a gauge symmetry of the bulk. But then the problem with that is that that statement is not literally true. Because as we already said, a gauge symmetry is a redundancy of description. It's changed under duality. How can something that's well-defined be dual to something that's not well-defined? So then you need a new definition. So actually in our paper, we gave a new definition of something we called a long-range gauge symmetry, uh, which is an abstract notion in quantum field theory, which is duality invariant. And we showed that having a global symmetry in the boundary is dual to having that in the bulk. Okay. But rather than take you all through that, although it's an interesting story, for example, you learn things about you know, for example, you have to wonder about things like, what if you have QCD and ADS in a confining phase? Is there a SU3 global symmetry in the boundary or not? Uh, let's vote, actually. Have Q we have QCD, a pure SU3 gauge theory in, in, the, in the bulk. Uh, um, in the confining phase, uh, is there a SU3 global symmetry in the boundary? Who says yes? Who says no? Yeah, yeah no, no is correct. There is not. Um, so that's already an example that Ed had, you know, in Ed, this thing Ed said in his paper, global symmetry, dual to gauge symmetry, you have to be a little more careful. Okay. Um, so you can read our paper if you want to learn about that. Um, what I'll do instead is note that even without that definition, right, I mean, we, could, we can just get a contradiction directly from this. We don't have to go through this roundabout thing of showing it's a gauge symmetry. Yes? So this is the, Uh, you know, I'm here. I'm only discussing zero form. Yeah, yeah. To talk about one form, then I, then I would need to have uh, you know strings, you know, stretching uh, or brains or something. Yeah. So here I'm just doing the zero form. There's a version of the argument also for one form, for higher form in our paper. Um, maybe the easiest way to say it is that introduce an extra compact direction, wrap the rest of the indices on the on the compact direction, and then run this argument again. Morally speaking, that's what we do. Uh, but okay, if that doesn't help you, then go look at the paper if you're curious. Okay, but anyways, I want to show, so there's a direct contradiction here, so we don't need to get into all this subtlety about the gauge symmetry. Um, so, so here's the contradiction. So if there is, say, say there were a global symmetry in the CFT, then there has to be, um, there has to be an O, so okay, now here's the contradiction. Okay, so if there were a global symmetry in the bulk, then there has to be an O, um, uh, which is charged, right? Uh, otherwise, it's this, it's this kind of trivial thing that's not really a symmetry. Um, so let's think about acting with that O uh, in the center of, of the bulk on the vacuum. 
Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study the commutator, or, you know, the action uh, on O by conjugation. And what I'm going to show you is that by using entanglement wedge reconstruction, um, this has to be equal to O. Uh, and that's a contradiction uh, because then it's not charged. Okay. So what's the contradiction? Well, here's the idea. So I have u of g. Here's my claim. My claim is that u of g actually has a nice representation. So I can split up the boundary into subregions. And let's call them r1, r2, r3, r4, etc. Um, so I can write u of g as the product over i of u of g and ri um, times some fudge factor that I'll explain in a sec, which I'll call u edge. So here I'm using, so here the idea is as follows. So we had a global symmetry in the bulk. By the argument we just gave, we have a global symmetry in the CFT. As we just discussed, global symmetries of a CFT on a sphere always are splittable. So I can define this U of G and R that implements the symmetry only in a subregion of the boundary, say this one. Okay? Um, then uh, by looking at the action of the U's on the operators, you can see that the total U. Well, it's almost the product of all these u of g and r's, right? That, that works for all the operators except the ones that are right at the edge. Uh, because remember, that was ambiguous because of uv issues. Uh, so then this u edge is here to fix that. So if you like, u edge is defined as this times the dagger of that, OK? And then you can see that it's an operator that acts non-trivially only in a small region around each of these things. Um, OK, but now you see we're dead. Because um, each of these is localized in a subregion of the boundary. By entanglement wedge um, reconstruction, they can only access things that are here. Um, so none of the things, on, every single thing on the right hand side of this equation has to commute with this O, at least within the code subspace. Um, and uh, that's already enough to get us in trouble because uh, this equation would have had to be non zero already in the code subspace. So, so therefore, since this commutes with everything on the right-hand side, it commutes with the left-hand side, and so then the operator is neutral. Okay. So, so let me now try to say a little bit more intuitively what happened here. The whole point we learned in this lecture series is that operators that are local in the boundary act near the boundary in the bulk. And that if you want to reach deep into the bulk, you need an operator which is big. And moreover, it's kind of not good enough to just be a product of, of small things. If you want to reach into the bulk, you need you know, a sum of product, you know, a sum of products of things. And whereas somehow for a global symmetry, in quantum field theory, the local action of the symmetry on the operators tells you that the symmetry is basically going to just be a product of a bunch of local things. You know, if you like, and for the continuous case, it's the e to the integral of the current. Uh, and in the discrete case, you can use splitability to come up to, with a similar statement. Um, so somehow the symmetry is just too simple. You know, it's just it's not non-local enough to be able to reach into the center of the bulk and act on something charged. Uh, okay, so that's the contradiction. Now, anyone want to say why this contradiction doesn't work if it's a gauge symmetry? Yeah, that's right. So if this were a gauge symmetry, then there would be a Wilson line running out to here, and then it would have gone into one of those regions. And then no matter how small I make the regions, it's always going to hit one of them. Well, or it's going to hit the U edge, but either way, it's going to hit something. Uh, and that's why, that's why it's consistent to have a gauge symmetry in the bulk, uh, but not a global symmetry. Um, all right, well, that, that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, obviously, there's a lot more that we could discuss about this. For example, we could try to prove the other two conjectures that I mentioned. Um, in my papers with Hiroshi, we do try to do that. Um, you know, you can also try to do higher form symmetries, space-time symmetries, you know, lots of uh, questions. For example, one fun question, can, parity, can you have parity be a global symmetry in quantum gravity? That's a question about a space-time symmetry. Uh, so, you know, you can think about that. So, lo lots of similar things. But I, I think I'll stop here and then take any more questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, can, you get, can you get approximate symmetries in the bulk? Yeah, yeah. So, you, so that's a good question, right? So uh, in some sense, the answer had, had better be yes, because, for example, B minus L looks like a pretty good symmetry in our world, right? Um,
course, we don't know if it's exact. In fact, we don't even know if it's a gauge symmetry. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, but uh, it could be a global symmetry, right? And certainly in string theory, there are examples where you have approximate global symmetries at low energies. Now, I want to emphasize the key difference is that in my language, those symmetries are things where you have a symmetry which is a good approximation in some code subspace, and it's terrible outside of the code subspace, right? Like if you looked at you know, high energy scattering with black holes, these things would just not even be close to being symmetries. They would just be totally bad. That, that's the kind of thing you get out of string theory. Um, and that's fine. You know, I, I mean, I, here I really had to use that it was a global symmetry of the whole CFT. Um, now, so you, then you can try to ask, okay, you can start trying to put in epsilons and say, okay, so say I start sort of trying to violate this a little bit, you know, how big of a code subspace can I have where I realize the, the symmetry and how good can I realize it within that subspace? And that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, yeah, and similarly with the other conjectures, like I said, there had to be states in all the irreps of the gauge group. You could ask, okay, is there upper bound on the mass? You know, what if those states, you know, can those states just be ridiculously heavy or do they need to be, you know, down, you know, for probably you would guess they'd be down around the Planck scale, but, you know, could you show that from, from our arguments? Uh, so, you know, we did not try to do that in any detail. We sort of casually thought about it a little bit, but that's it. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, but so you from from two to three is kind of easy. So uh, so the argument of of uh, Faulkner, Lukowitz, and Malusena. So y you have to kind of regularize to d talk about the von Neumann entropy. But then to get from two to three is kind of the easiest step. Um, so you can kind of do that in the regulated theory and then take the limit. Um, on the other hand, I think it would be very educational to extend the result of uh, Monica and I think the other guy's name is Daniel um, to. Uh, to directly to infinite dimensions by talking about differences of entropy. So I believe, although I don't know, that for example, if you take the entropy of an excited state minus the entropy of the vacuum, then that should be well defined in the UV. There are some subtleties with that, so I don't want to I don't want to bet the farm on that, but it, it seems to be true in simple examples. Um, I'm imagining a version of RT that's not using relative entropy because that's just point three anyway, but some differences of entropy is Yeah, but if you if the entropies are sort of all defined with respect to a fixed state then it kind of seems like it'll just come along for the ride and everything, right? Because I had an entropy on both sides and, yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I haven't thought about it in detail. Um, yeah. Um, so, I'm just a little bit confused about one point. Um, yeah. You said here that all of these quantum equivalents, sorry, all CFT operators, these quantum equivalents are acting, it adds you prior to the sphere, the zero of the sphere, and then evolving with the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that then that that's has that right. So then that becomes something that's charged under what I call a long range gauge symmetry in the bulk. So then you get one of these guys with the Wilson line attaching it to the boundary. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So CPT, but CPT will be a gauge symmetry in the bulk. Yeah, yeah, you can use this to conclude that CPT can't be a global <coughs> symmetry in the bulk, which is, which is something that's non-trivial. I mean, you could have imagined, you, you know, there, I mean, there are even sort of low-dimensional examples of theories of gravity which have global symmetries, but they're, they're not holographic. Like a canonical example is the string world sheet. So in, in some silly sense, the string world sheet is a theory of quantum gravity. And for example, there's world sheet parity. It's a global symmetry. If you're doing, well, actually, it's, it, whether it's gauged or global decides whether you're talking about the oriented or the unoriented string. If, I hope I said it right. David will tell me if I didn't. But I think in the oriented string, it's a global symmetry. And in the unoriented string, it's a gauge symmetry. Yeah. But, but the thing is, the, the, the world sheet of the oriented string is not a holographic theory. You know, it doesn't have black hole microstates or anything like that. So you know, here, I mean, I'm using ADS CFT. So um, yeah, there are these funny theories out there that kind of you know, make sense with the bulk Lagrangian as the theory of quantum gravity, and they kind of don't fit into what we usually think about quantum gravity. Uh, yeah. So your code, uh, is there a formula for the entanglement energy cross-section? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, okay, to, for everyone else, so there's some conjecture. So there's something called um, 
entanglement of purification. And uh, two groups, one involving, uh, I'm, I'm really bad, sorry, I to, I've uh, apologized to the other authors, but one, one of them has Tadashi Takinagi and the other one has Brian Swingle. And then there's large groups, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who all the people are. But they have this conjectured formula in the bulk for um, this thing called the entanglement of purification of a state. Uh, and it involves taking this entanglement wedge and then introducing some geometric construction they call the entanglement wedge cross-section. And there are some checks that it's equal to, you know, consistent with it being equal to the entanglement of purification. Um, I don't know if it's true. Uh, y you might be able to, but, uh, you know, there w I know someone who tried to do that for a while and couldn't get it to work. Um, but, uh, yeah, for example, like, it's interesting to ask just in, like, tensor network models, is that formula true? Yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, let me also add, right, so, so, of course, it's sort of both good and bad that I was able to prove that this is true in any code, because, like, <coughs> you know, really we want stuff that's true only when it's actually holographic, right? And so, there, so far, the only example of that I know, which is understood very well, has to do with the independence of Renyi entropies. So, there was, a, so there, there was a paper by two students from Berkeley, Chris Akers and Pratik Rath, and then I wrote a paper with uh, Don Meroff and Shi Dong explaining how getting the Renyi entropies to be consistent with a semi-classical structure of the bulk puts constraints on the structure of the straight chi. Uh, and so that's kind of useful, because in this, what I was talking about, this chi is just some arbitrary state. Um, so yeah, I mean, and clearly there's a lot more about that, like trying to understand, like, what are the additional constraints from actually having a good bulk, you know, semi-classical bulk. Um, <laughs> okay.